The epistle of when we read for the fourth Sunday after the Epiphany is taken from the epistle of St. Paul to the Romans. Brethren, owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth his neighbor hath fulfilled the law. For thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is comprised in this word. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The love of our neighbor worketh no evil. Love, therefore, is the fulfilling of the law. And the Holy Gospel is a gospel taken from St. Matthew, chapter 8, verses 23 to 27. At that time, when Jesus entered into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, a great tempest arose in the sea, so that the boat was covered with waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awakened him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And Jesus saith to them, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Then rising up, he commanded the winds and the sea, and there came a great calm. But the men wondered, saying, What manner of man is this? For the winds and the sea obey him. Thus are the words of today's Holy Gospel. Behold, a great tempest arose in the sea, so that the boat was covered with waves, but he was asleep. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Menaced by innumerable dangers, we steer our course over the ways of time towards the great harbor of eternity. We carry within us a very precious cargo. It's an immortal soul, marked with the very image of the triune God and redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. It's our duty to deliver this cargo very safely to its destination. And when the many dangers and tempests arise and the wild waves of temptation break over our boat, we are often cry out with fear and forced to cry, Lord, save us, we perish. But why are there storms on the ocean of life? Why do we encounter bitter waves of suffering, which are continually rolling over our tiny little vessel? Manifold are the sufferings which we meet with in the lives of the good as well as the bad, in all walks of life. Every man carries a portion of this common misery of suffering. St. Paul says to Timothy, all who will live piously in Christ Jesus, shall suffer persecution. Yes, the very best and most virtuous are tried in the crucible of suffering. And like St. Paul, of whom our Lord said to Ananias, I will show him how great things he must suffer for the sake of my name. Our holy faith teaches us to contemplate these trials as a consequence of sin, as a school of virtue, and a source of merit for heaven. For thousands of years, man's natural reason has vainly endeavored to solve the difficult problem of human misery and human woe. But faith tells us it is sin. Sin is the only source of all human sufferings and trials. Man was not created by God for sufferings. Holy Scripture calls the place in which Almighty God placed our first parents the paradise of delights. It was in this paradise of delights that our first parents were to live, not in the veil of tears, but all men were supposed to live in the the paradise of delights. Our first parents were to live in that garden of joy, and by obedience to God's holy commandments, they were to guard the unprofaned soil of the earth against the entrance of sin and against the entrance of evil. But they sinned, and they were driven from the abode of their happiness. There is but one pain, but one real affliction in this world, and that is sin, whose punishment we endure. And because of it, we are rejected, we're cast off in God's sight, and wander about upon the accursed earth. Whatever we call sufferings, whether they're temporal trials, whether it's sickness, death, and the various army of mundane cares and troubles that come to us are all consequences of one great evil, and that is sin. And therefore, can we wonder or complain if we are subjected to this universal lot? Every child of Adam, born of a sinful mother, living in the cursed soil of the earth, must expect to meet with trials and tribulations. Without sufferings, 
A man would not be a member of the human family. The most beneficent civil laws and the ordinances are powerless to banish poverty or woe from the dwellings of men. The wisest and the most circumspect of statesmanship fails to keep misfortune from its members. The highest medical skill will never disarm death. Our good God has permitted a partial alleviation of earthly woe and misery, but not the entire removal. Man may abolish the sentence, may not abolish the sentence of divine justice. The universal curse is augmented and aggravated by our own personal sins. The fault lies not in our condition, whether we be wealthy or whether we be poor, It lies in ourselves. Our Lord visits upon our iniquities the rod and our crimes with stripes. Sin committed with pleasure must be atoned for by suffering. Innumerable tribulations were the divine punishment for the sin of Adam. And every new sin is chastised by God by the infliction of a fresh individual sorrow. We, must, would, we would be spared much temporal affliction and unhappiness had we committed fewer sins. The sinner usually does wear a smile. The habitual sinner drinks in iniquity like water. He wipes his mouth and says, I have sinned in what evil has befallen me. But nevertheless, every sin demands punishment and expiation. The least Venial sin, if we can call it that, is more disastrous in its effect than the overthrow of all the thrones and kingdoms and the destruction of the entire visible world. Because one venial sin is committed against an infinite God. Every sin draws after it a heavy chain, a heavy chain of chastisements and sorrows. And long after the commission of a sinful act, the development of its momentous consequences prepares the sinner for unspeakable anxiety and woe. If the divine justice has continued for 6,000 years to visit upon all men the punishment of Adam's sin. If because of sin the Son of God is obliged to undergo his terrible torments and his passion and death, and if sin of the angels was capable of opening a great abyss of everlasting punishment, we should not be astonished if God, with the same justice, chastises each and every one of our sins by certain pains and sufferings. But if we bear these sufferings patiently, They will prove to be a school of virtue wherein we will be powerfully drawn to the love of God. Sufferings and afflictions make us truly pious. They make us virtuous. The human heart is so hard. It must first be softened like wax if it's to receive the impression of those virtues which our Savior demands and of which he and the saints have practiced. The glowing heat of affliction is the best calculated to make the metal of our souls fit and ready for the molding by our divine master. Sufferings make men serious. They lead him to appreciate life in its highest significance. The gloomy and background of life, excuse me, the gloomy background of life, eternity and its admonitions are brought more before the soul and by the sharp pencil of affliction Sorrow elevates one to the holy gravity which distinguishes a Catholic from the fool. Sufferings elevate man to the higher and grandier thoughts and tell him loudly and impressively about the joys and the goods of this life are only shows and illusions and that if he would find true reward, he must mount upward the steps of the ladder of toil and care and suffering. And by true Catholic repentance for sin. Many people 
would never rise to a serious thought if trouble and affliction did not lead the way to those thoughts. Sufferings admonish us to humility, to confidence in God, to prayer, to all those virtues which the realization of what this life is true meaning of demands of us. St. Bernard says very truly, virtues increase by God's chastisements. Sins decrease and become fewer. And things of earth are despised and the things of heaven one loves. Pride which trusts itself on the grounds and its hopes upon all earthly good is easily broken by tribulations. <clears throat> Suffering compels man <clears throat> to place his whole confidence in the mighty one who alone is in our power and helper and deliverer. Sufferings and tribulations incite us also to a greater love of our neighbor, <clears throat> to make us meek, to be inclined to forgive, to make us benevolent, to make us merciful. It opens man's heart with violence so that the feeling of his own distresses helps him to recognize and estimate the sorrows and cares of others. <clears throat> we should not cry and complain when our Lord calls us to himself by sorrows and sufferings and constrains us to practice so many virtues. Suffering is the bitter but necessary medicine that secures the health and salvation of our souls. Just as the sick man is willingly and gladly takes the nauseating medicine, which is necessary for his cure, and he undergoes the most painful operations to save his life, so we must view every suffering and every mundane misery as necessary in the salutary medicine for the salvation of our souls. The sacred scripture tells us that God loves those whom he chastises. God loves those whom he chastises. And our faith teaches us that it's in the trials and tribulations of life that we have a proof. We have a proof of God's love for us, a very special grace. Tribulations test the worth of our souls. They blot out the stains of sin and remit punishment due to them. They obtain for us the highest reward. Sufferings are the test of the soul. They are the touchstone of the, our actual worth before Almighty God. He who remains virtuous in the greatest afflictions and in the bitterest necessities of life and at the same time overcomes temptation is truly a pious soul. How we act in sorrows, in trials, in tribulations is the measure of our virtue. Sufferings and tribulations have at the same time a purgative effect upon our soul. They are the purgatory of this world. Just as gold comes forth from the furnace with a new brilliancy, a finer luster, purified from all the dross and everything that is impure ingredient. <clears throat> so does man's soul shine forth in the splendor and higher purity when it is gone through the fires of probation. Every sinful inclination, every inordinate love, every attachment to earthly possession will be dislodged and removed by the purifying fires of suffering. The soul will come forth from the furnace, furnace of distress, the furnace of disappointment, washed clean from every stain of evil. Our joy will be overwhelming when we think of the eternal reward with our Lord reserves for his, our patient and our long suffering in our trials and tribulations. The greater the sacrifice we make for God, the more difficult the virtues practiced, the more abundant the more delicious will be the reward. My dear faithful, the instruments of our Lord's passion are his glory. They are his glory in heaven. The wounds with which he was inflicted upon him now shine upon his glorified body in the signs of his eternal triumph. The cross on which he died shall appear as a glorious symbol when he shall come to judge in his splendor and his majesty. 
And so to our suffering shall be the cause of our glory in heaven. The thorny crown of suffering which our Lord encircles on our brow here will be changed into the sweet and radiant heavenly crown. That which we have to endure here and for love of him shall be more richly rewarded than all the other labors for the honor of God. The hours of affliction will be the richest in blessings and all the moments of our lives will be because we have arrived safely at our eternal reward. My dear faithful, may we bear the sufferings which God in his goodness and his wisdom sends to us. And may we do so with a Catholic patience, a Catholic resignation, so that the afflictions which oppress us as a consequence of sin may become for us the school of virtue, Maybe they come for us a source of merit for our eternal happiness. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.